So what's the hyper trail? I have no f***ing clue. <laughs> so today I'm going to be talking about uh, Ralph Merkel's PhD thesis, which is like 200 pages. It is Goliath, and it has a lot of, um, there's like four or five unrelated things all together in this paper, which he did over like five or six years. So if you want to like learn about cryptography, just read this paper, because it covers like so many things. And uh, it was from 1979, which is before any kind of public key cryptography existed. Like there was no such thing as SSL. You couldn't go to like your banking website and expect it to be secure, because there was no way to do that. But these guys were inventing it, and this is one of the papers that helped invent it. So that's really cool. Um, other cool thing about the paper is that it's pretty self-contained. Um, he either explains everything you need to know, or he references papers where the things you need to know are explained. Um, so everything that I'm talking about here is basically covered in the paper. So it's a great like one-stop resource to just like learn a bunch of historical stuff about cryptography, um, and also some practical things because a lot of uh, a lot of the things that he talks about are actually still secure today, with the exception of one thing. Um, so before I start, as I go along, I'm going to be asking you guys if you have any questions. I really, really hope that you guys will say things. Uh, even if even if you think it's a dumb question, or if you think you understand something you just want to clarify, uh, please ask, because my goal is to have you guys understand all this stuff you know, as well as I possibly can. Um, you know, it's okay if you wanted to know, that's fine, but if you if you wanna, you know, if you wanna ask questions, please don't hesitate. Um, I you know, absolutely no problem. Please interrupt me, uh, whatever. Um, so that's the cover of the paper. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple things. I'm going to try to get you guys up to speed on um, kind of the, the things you need to know to understand the rest of the paper. Like I said, all this stuff is in the paper, so um, if, if some of this stuff doesn't make sense, um, reading the paper will explain it. Uh, I'm going to also stick around later, so please feel free to uh, come and talk and we'll, you can chat about stuff. Also interrupt me if anything doesn't make sense. Um, so we're going to talk about pro probability and how it relates to cryptography and why it's important. Um, conventional cryptography, which is what existed at the time of the writing of this paper. Um, and then Merkel's puzzles, uh, Merkel's puzzle method for uh, agreeing on a key over an insecure channel. So that is, uh, if you and I have never talked before, how do we get a shared key that we can use to encrypt one in the, to one another? Um, the trapdoor knapsack method of public key encryption. So if you've ever used RSA, where you can you have a public key and you can encrypt something to a person, so that's different from key agreement, where key agreement is we both end up with the same key, or we both agree on the same key, but we don't really get to pick what the key is. Uh, trapdoor knapsack lets you actually encrypt something specific to another person. So uh, that's pretty cool. And then the last thing we're going to talk about is hash-based signatures, um, which is a really cool method for basically making signatures that are actually still secure today and are quantum resistant. Uh, as opposed to everything else we use today. So that's kind of neat. And this is from 1979, and it's still secure. So uh, These amounts of times are totally made up, I just guessed. Uh, they might not even sum to an hour. I, I thought, I just kind of guessed, so anyway. Uh, so first thing I'm going to talk about is a little bit of probability. Um, so in a couple places, you'll see, uh, you'll see key sizes like 128 bits, 256 bits, things like that. Uh, really all that means is that um, a key of that size is going to be really hard to guess. Uh, if you wanted to guess it, you'd have to try every possible key, and that's really hard when the key is big. When the key is small, it's easy to guess, because there's only a few possibilities. Um, bits are either ones or zeros, so there's two possibilities for each bit. So when you have, uh, you know, you can see how it grows exponentially. Green is, where, is what we want to look at for, for bits as you increase key size. So if you have, a, as you can see here, if you had a six-bit key, which is not secure, uh, that's about 200 choices or so. Uh, as you get up to like 10, you're talking like 1,500. And then once you get up to something like 32 bits, you get like 4 billion choices. And it just goes up from there. Uh, you know, 128-bit key is like more choices than any computer can ever count. Um, some anecdotal thing I heard about how big a 128-bit key is is that you have to consume all the power that a, um, all the power that the, uh, it's the really huge dam in the States, I can't remember what it's called. Uh, you have to consume all the power it makes for a year just to count through all those possibilities. And that's not even actually checking whether it's correct. 
Is this the Hoover Dam? Sorry. Yeah, Hoover Dam, exactly. Thank you. Exactly right. Um, so, important thing about the reason probability is important is that literally everything in cryptography is not a case of, uh, you know, this thing is unbreakable. It's always a case of this thing is probably not breakable. And we can decide how unbreakable we want to make it by increasing the key size by basically making it so it's out of reach for most attackers. Um, so all the cryptography we use today, for the most part, is out of reach for conventional attackers. Um, using a 120-bit key, for example, that will be out of reach for a long time, probably. Um, if quantum computers become a thing, it will become more in reach. Um, but again, it's all probability. It's always a case of it's probably not breakable today. Um, and then you kind of, for a lot of, in a lot of cases, you lose efficiency as you make the keys bigger. So it's always a trade-off. Um, so when we talk about key size, we talk about brute force. Um, so if you have, 100, as I said, 120-bit key, that's 2 to the power of 128 possibilities, which is a really huge number. That's how many possible keys there are that you have to try and break. Um, something else we'll, we'll talk about is the trapdoor problem, which is basically uh, introduces the idea of having an attacker versus a defender um, advantage. So. For a crypto system to be useful, I have to be able to, as a defender, using the crypto system, I have to be able to use it efficiently. Let's say it should take like less than one second for me to do something, or whatever is reasonable for your use case. If I'm sending a piece of mail, it doesn't have to be one second. It could be you know, an hour or something like that. If I have to encrypt a piece of mail, like literal physical mail, where I am not sending them all the time. Um, but for an attacker, it, you know, if the data has to remain safe for 10 years, then it should take at least 10 years for an attacker to break it. So, um, that's basically what we, how we pick these numbers. Is it has to be hard enough for an attacker to guess all possibilities such that the data is safe for 10, 20 years, that kind of thing. Uh, whenever you read uh, standardized uh, cryptography stuff, like government recommendations for key sizes and stuff like that, they'll talk about uh, you know 20 year security, 50 year security. Um, it's not forever security. It's always you know like less than a lifetime because uh, computers get way faster over time and people come up with new algorithms to make things faster. Um, everything in cryptography is, is some problems are hard, uh, or all problems are hard until they're made easy. So a good example is factoring. Um, we have algorithms to efficiently and very quickly multiply two big numbers, um, like very quickly, like milliseconds for numbers that are like 400 digits. Uh, but factoring that can, is not efficient right now. We have no good way to, we can, we can put the numbers together, but we can't get them back out efficiently. Uh, Somebody could very well come up with an algorithm that makes that fast, uh, but nobody has done it yet. And so things like RSA remain safe. Uh, intentionally dumb question. Can you just remind people who may have forgotten what factoring is? Oh, sure. Um, so uh, the simplest example is if you have two prime numbers, so two numbers that have no, uh, they can't be divided by anything except for one of themselves. Uh, if you multiply them together uh, and you wanted to factor that resulting number, it would give you those two numbers back. Uh, it's basically, when you multiply, so say you have uh, four, the number four, it has two prime factors, which are two and two. Or if you had six, it has two prime factors, which are three and two. So for those numbers, uh, the way that you, or for all numbers really, the way that you find, the way that you factor numbers is you do what's called trial multiplication. You just try every possible division of a number, uh, or every possible, some optimizations in there you could do, but. That's basically the way you do it, is you just guess and check. So that's why it's really slow. Nobody's been able to improve on that method. Uh, whereas multiplication, we have things where we like keep track of previous values and we can reuse them and stuff. And so it becomes like way faster. So somebody has a fast way to multiply, but nobody's figured out a fast way to factor yet. So that's basically the core of, of all the probability stuff that, that crypto relies on that, that you guys will know. So conventional cryptography, this is stuff that existed at the time of this paper. And it was, this stuff was basically a solved problem. Um, uh, Ralph Merkel in his paper didn't really try to improve on anything. Uh, at the time, uh, DES, which is the predecessor to AES, uh, was in existence and it was pretty good. It's still safe today. Really the only way it's not safe is because it has a small key size. Or we talked about 128 bit keys, DES only uses 56 bits, which is breakable today. Um, so in this kind of diagram, basically, the way that you can do encryption, and the way you can communicate with somebody privately, is you share a key with the two parties that need to talk, and then sender can encrypt to the recipient who can decrypt and read, and vice versa. Because they share a key, they can send messages back and forth to each other. 
Uh, an eavesdropper who sees the encrypted messages can't do anything with them because he, does, he or she doesn't have the key. So this dotted line in here is basically saying that we need a, we need to like meet up and exchange the key, or I need to put the key in, you know, I need to drop it in a Canada Post mailbox, and it needs to get delivered to this person, and we have to pray that the, you know, the Canada Post is on our side. Um, that's basically what this means. There's no good, easy way to get a key to both people. Just make sure I have all that stuff covered. Um, so yeah, AES and RC4 are examples of things like this. DES was, was what was his use at the time. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's basically the idea of a secret key cipher, where the key has to be shared among everybody, and it has to be secret forever, otherwise you can decrypt past communications. Uh, there's no way to come up with a key on the fly without prior arrangements. So later on, we'll talk about how to get that K to everybody without, uh, without uh, people being able to intercept it, people who shouldn't have it. So the other thing that is going to become relevant later is the concept of hashes. So it's actually really cool, because in this paper, uh, hashes didn't exist yet. Um, Ralph Merkel and his cohorts, uh, like uh, Whitfield Diffie and uh, s stuff like that, Ivan Damgard, they knew that hashes needed to exist. Um, they knew that they would be important. And so they started building things based on the idea of them before they existed. So remember this paper's from 1979? SHA-1, which is uh, just being phased out now, um, that was basically the first actually secure hash algorithm. It didn't come out for like another 10 or 15 years. So if you can imagine um, knowing about the idea of jet engines, but nobody's built the jet engine yet, and you start designing a plane that will fly if you have jet engines, that's kind of what these guys are doing, which is crazy to me. But um, so the way that hashes work is you take an arbitrary amount of input, you run it through the algorithm, and you get a fixed size thumbprint of the data. So if you've ever heard of a checksum, or like, like CRC32, or something like that, uh, that's basically what it is. It's like a fixed size thing that is meant to detect you know, changes or errors in the input. Um, it can consume any amount of input and produce a fixed size output. Um, the one thing that makes it special compared to a regular checksum like CRC32 or something, to, be, to make it cryptographically usable, is it has to have two properties. You cannot, you have to not be able to guess the output from the input. I'm sorry, other way around. You can't guess the input from the output. That's called pre resistance, or second pre resistance. There's like two kinds. And then also, uh, if you know the input, and you know an out, if you know the input and the output, you can't find another input that has the same output. Uh, so that's, you can't find a collision, you can't find, yeah, there's like a bunch of different terms for it. pre image resistance and collision resistance are the terms that you want to look for though. Um, there's no key involved, so if, if I know the input, I can make the same output, period. There's no key involved. Um, if I have the input and I have the output, I can verify that the input matches the output. Nothing secret about it. You can, in a special way that makes it safe, you can combine a key with this in order to get what's called a message integrity check or message authentication check, or code. So the C is for code, not for check, a Mac or a Mac. Um, and that allows you to, with a key, basically say that this part, it, it's kind of like a secret key um, uh, signature. It's we both share a key, and we can verify each other's messages from each other, but we can't verify, you know, if somebody steals that key, or if we have like four or five people all in a group with the same key, there's no way to tell exactly who it came from because you can all generate the same signatures and verify the same signatures, the same mix and the same mix. So yeah, that's going to become important later. Um, yeah. So uh, one really useful property of these, or a use of them, I should say, uh, is if you take this, uh, the output, say I want to send you an Ubuntu Live CD image, or uh, you know a zip file with something in it, uh, and it's big, and I want you to be able to verify it when you get it, so you know it's from me. Um, I can give you this ahead of time, and then you can get the file from me and verify it against that. So you'll see that website sometimes, you'll see like an MD5 sum that you can download and check or whatever like that. Um, so that's, that's really important. It basically is a good way to take a big message and make it small, which is important because a lot of uh, the signing algorithms and stuff that we'll see later, they only operate on like a small fixed size message. So it's a good way to take a big message and make it work with those 
those primitives. So yeah, all the stuff that we've talked about so far, hash algorithms, secret key, yep. Is it possible to have two um, different messages result in the same output hash? It is possible because of uh, probability, because of the pigeonhole principle, which is that because the output is a fixed size, it's a great question by the way, uh, actually I'm gonna repeat it. The question is, um, is it possible for two inputs to have the same output? And the answer is yes, and that's simply because the input is, can be of an unlimited size. So there's infinite possible inputs to these algorithms, and the outputs are fixed size. So there's only so many possible outputs. So that means that over time, eventually, there will be a collision. You will, there, there are infinite messages and not infinite outputs, so eventually one will match the other one. The uh, importance or, or the, the role these play, though, is they should make it hard to find that. Uh, it should take you, you know, as long as it takes to break AES as it takes to find a collision. Um, so it's possible, again, it's all probability, right? Uh, the output is a certain size, the bigger it is, the harder it is to find one of those collisions. So you just say, you know, I think this is going to be safe for the next 20 years. Um, hopefully nobody can, you know, replace my PDF with somebody else's PDF or whatever and have it have the same output. Um, so yes, it can, uh, it has to because of unlimited input and fixed size output, but it should be hard to do that. And when I say hard, I mean impossible in practice. Um, so yeah, all these things that we've talked about, the hash algorithms and the secret keys, secret key ciphers, um, totally solved the problem. Uh, hashes didn't exist at the time, but we'll pretend that they did because uh, these guys knew how they were supposed to work and they work like that today. So all these things we've talked about already solved problem. Don't really have a lot of competitions for them today because we have AES, so we have SHA-256. We have these secure algorithms that we can use. So, jumping ahead to, so the key distribution problem, I alluded to this earlier. Um, this K has to be shared with everybody. How do we get the K to everybody? How do we do that without actually meeting in person? Uh, you might think, hey, why don't we just meet in person? That's not a big deal, right? But if the receiver is your bank, or your bank's website, and the sender is your mobile phone, should you have to take your mobile phone to your bank and like, you know, figure out a key? Not really, it's, you know, you can, but Basically, having, uh, being able to come up with a key on the fly enables a whole bunch of different kinds of cool things, like being able to just sign into eBay and buy stuff and know that it's going to be secure. Um, yeah, so there's basically two things that we're going to talk about, or I guess three things. Uh, being able to send a key to somebody else that they can decrypt and then you can use. Um, being able to sign messages in such a way that I can make a signature and you can verify it, but you can't make a signature on my behalf, you can't forge signatures. Uh, and that allows you to verify that the receiver is who you think they are. Uh, and then the last one is key agreement, which I mentioned earlier, is being able to uh, have, we, we come up with a key together, we don't get to pick what the key is, but we come up with a key together. So the first thing is uh, Merkle's puzzles. So this is a really cool method because it's really simple in my opinion. Um, so the construction of them is basically you have a good strong key, and you have a random ID for the puzzle. Um, these can't be related to each other. When I say random ID for the puzzle, really it's random ID for the key. It identifies the key. So Alice generates a whole bunch of these puzzles, and each puzzle gets in encrypted with a breakable key, a key that you could brute force in, say, one second. Um, and that you obviously have to scale as computers get more powerful. You have to decide what that number is, how, how strong that key should be, if it's a 40-bit key or if it's a 56-bit key, whatever it happens to be. And then you have your actually secure key inside. Then you have a random ID with it. Both of those are encrypted together um, so that anybody who's listening in cannot see the ID or the key. And so Alice generates a whole bunch of them and sends them all. And Bob chooses one at random and breaks it. So let's say it takes him one second to break it. Now he's broken it and he has a strong key. So he sends the random ID back to Alice and Alice knows the mapping between the the strong key and the rand and the identifier. And so now they both know which key to use, and they've now agreed on a key. So Alice doesn't get to choose exactly which key to use. She gets to generate all the keys, but Bob gets to choose at random which key to use. An attacker has to break, on average, half of these puzzles in order to find the key that they picked. So, yeah, does that make sense, why that works, why it's secure? Yeah? Do so they close the connection as soon as they've established connect? Like Establish the puzzle? Um, why do you ask that? Because what if they're sending to multiple um, 
multiple people for different keys. Oh, okay, good question. Um, so this is meant to be strictly between two people. So it's between you and your bank, or it's between you and your girlfriend, that kind of thing, just between two people. Having multiple parties involved makes crypto really complicated if you want to have it like secure between everybody, but also, yeah. There's a couple of like open things that people are working on to make like instant messaging secure in that way, uh, like NPOTR. Um, there's OTR, which is between two people, and that's secure, but having multiple people who are all like authenticated, but also, you know, it's private between individual people, that gets more complicated. So that's kind of an, an open thing that people don't really have a lot of, uh, at least I, as far as I know, there's nothing really good about that. Uh, this is just meant for two people. So, yeah, so this was actually, so nobody was able to agree on a key over an unsecure channel before. This was the first, like, uh, way to do this, basically. So he, like, invented public key cryptography with this method. I think around about the same time, like maybe a year previously or something, Whitfield Diffie and uh, Martin Hellman came up with the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which is way more efficient, in use today still. Um, and so that superseded this because this uh, can only ever be the, I mentioned earlier the attacker defender trade-off, which is um, if it takes me one second to do a key exchange, it should be, you know, that should protect the data for long enough where I, the data no longer matters. So it should protect it for 20 years or 10 years or whatever is important. If I'm telling you what we're having for dinner, it just needs to be protected until the next day or something, I don't know. Um, but if, it, if it's like nuclear missile codes, then it needs to be secure until the codes are changed or whatever. So the problem with this is that it's at best a quadratic trade-off. So in other words, I have a bunch of numbers that are examples of that. Um, if it takes 30 seconds for Bob to break a key, or to break a puzzle and get a key, uh, then the attacker has about, f it takes about 15 minutes for the attacker to break this key. If it takes a minute for Bob to do it, it takes about 25 hours, or uh, it takes about one hour for the attacker. If it takes five minutes for Bob to uh, break one of the puzzles, it takes 25 hours for the attacker. So basically the trade-off is not that great. It's good, and it's, it was an amazing result at the time, but we have better methods today. Yep. For the attacker, time to solve, would the not depend on the number of sealed puzzles to send? Yes, great question. So there are a bunch of ways you can tweak this. Well, a couple ways you can tweak this. You can change the strength of the brute forceable keys. So you can increase the strength of the keys. You can increase how many puzzles there are. Um, but optimally, there is an optimal way to do it. And I can't remember what it is exactly, but it's basically kind of half and half. You send a whole lot of puzzles with a reasonably strong key. Um, yeah, it's basically at best, it will only ever be a quadratic trade-off. There are ways where you can make it less than quadratic, which is bad. Uh, optimally, it's only ever quadratic. It's only ever, you know, 60 seconds for the attacker, one hour for the, or 60 seconds for the, you know, for Bob, an hour for the attacker, or whatever. That's about the best you can do with it. Yep. How does Bob send the key back? Would so, it be oh. an unsecure channel as well, or? So, okay, good question. So. When Alice sends all these puzzles, remember she sends an ID from the, the key and the actual key. They're all encrypted. So he breaks one, and when he breaks it, he gets the ID and he gets the key. So what he does is he sends the key, or he sends, I'm sorry, he sends the ID back to Alice, and Alice knows which IDs correspond to which keys. So he just breaks one, yeah. sends the ID back to Alice unencrypted, because the ID doesn't mean anything on its own. Alice knows which IDs correspond to which keys. Nobody else does. They're generated randomly. There's no connection between them. So then they both know the key ID to use. They both know the key based on that. Uh, Bob doesn't learn all of the keys because then he would have to break all of them. He only breaks one at random, and that gets him a key that he can use with her. And then the attacker has to break all of them if she wants to find the ID that he sent and then get the key correspondingly. So if the uh, IDs were not encrypted, if they were outside, then um, you know, the attacker would be able to see, oh, that's the, he sent back this ID, which means that's the one I have to break. So the trick is that they're, both of them are encrypted under the same, uh, same weak key. So, uh, yeah, so that's a really cool thing because that is like still secure today. They, it, it only requires secret key, secret key cryptography. There's no special math or anything really involved with it. Um, it's just not that efficient. It doesn't have that good of a trade-off. But as Merkel said in his paper, uh, it was the first break in what seemed like a smooth, solid wall uh, at the time. So that's pretty neat. Um, so the next thing is the knapsack problem. I'm going to try and whiz through this because this has been broken, so it's kind of less interesting. Um, but 
he basically he builds a, a crypto system on this principle, which is that if you have a bag that can only hold 15 kilograms, and you have a whole bunch of boxes, and let's say you know that those box that some group of those boxes will will fill the the bag completely, how do you find which group of those boxes to use? Um, and that that depending on how you choose the boxes is can be really difficult to solve or it can be really easy. Um, so we will talk about why that is the case. So he, he uses um, one-dimensional knapsacks, which is basically a knapsack that has only the property of depth or length or whatever, just one dimension. And all the things that go in it also just have one dimension. So if you can imagine like a tube um, and a whole bunch of cylinders that go into it, that's, uh, that's basically what we're talking about. So diagram for that there. Um, so don't actually try to solve this because I made a mistake and they don't actually fill the tube properly. So, um, so this is when you have this special case of a one-dimensional knapsack. The one, the knapsack problem can have a whole bunch of dimensions to it. Like you can have, as that previous image had, you can have a weight, you can have a cost, you can have, uh, you know, width and height and depth and stuff like that. And that makes it really, really difficult to solve, uh, or it makes it more complicated anyway. Um, this special case where you just have, you know, a length to fill and a bunch of varying lengths to go into it, uh, where it's one dimensional, that's a special case called the subset sum problem. Um, so yeah, we're gonna talk about that. I'm gonna kind of switch back and forth between the terminology. If that confuses you, please let me know and I can explain it. But basically they're one dimensional knapsacks and the subset sum problem are the same, totally the same. Yeah, so based on how you choose these red cylinders, um, it's either very slow or very fast to determine what the, which cylinders you have to put in to totally fill it. So now we're switching to kind of like math mode. I'm gonna try and whiz through this because it's not terribly interesting, but basically you have an easy and a hard knapsack. Um, the difference between the two is one is called super increasing and one is not. Super increasing just means that each value in the set has to be greater than the sum of all previous values. That's it. So you might recognize this as like the sequence of powers of two. Uh, that happens to be um, uh, super increasing. You can also do like 1, 5, 200, 5,000. That would also be super increasing. Um, so the two, using a, a greedy algorithm to solve both of them, uh, you can see that when it's a hard knapsack, it takes many more steps because you have to keep backtracking. But when you construct a knapsack like this, where it's super increasing, it's really, really easy. Um, so when it's 10, basically, so, so again, the, the problem that we're trying to solve is we know that there's we know that in a set of numbers there's some subset that that when added together will make that number. The question is which numbers will do that. So when it's super increasing like this, the algorithm is just look for the eight or look for the number that is equal to or less than ten. So that's eight. So we select eight, and then we say okay, we have two left over, so we have to look for a two or less. So we find the two. Done. That's the subset. Easy to solve with the hard math stack. Uh, again, sum is 10, numbers are chosen to be hard. So you try, again greedy, you try to get rid of them as quickly as possible, so you look for a, um, you look for something that's 10 or less, and you find nine, somewhere in there, did I delete it? Okay, perfect, pretend there's a nine in there. I like, kept tweaking this to make this as hard looking as possible, but. Um, so pretend there's a nine in there, so you select nine, and then you have one left over, so you look for one or less, and you see that there's no ones, so you have to backtrack, you have to start over. So we look for something less than nine, we find a six. So we select the six, um, so then we have to look for four or less, and we see that none of those are in there. So we have to start over again. So eventually we come to five, we select the two fives, and that's the subset. So hard knapsack, easy knapsack. Does that make sense? Makes sense like the, the idea of the subset sum problem and why it's difficult? Cool, okay. So two tips, if you end up trying to read this paper later, this is really rough for me because I have like no math background at all. Um, I did pre-Cal 30 in high school and then I did statistics at college and that's it. So I have like no math background at all. So in the paper, I don't know if I have a slide, yeah, I have a slide for it. So you'll see stuff like the sigma notation and stuff. I've seen sigma before, I, I, I know what that means, but I saw this on the left side, I was like, I've never seen that in my life where there's like a condition on the left side of it. Like I thought the, you know, the thing was supposed to be on the right or whatever. So. When it's on the left side like that, it means that it is, it's not related to sigma, it's just, um, it's AI is being compared to that, whatever that makes. So they're entirely separate. I didn't realize that, I got me really confused. 
I looked at the Wikipedia page and it explained it differently. It explained it as being super increasing, and then I looked at that again and I was like, oh, that makes sense. So the Wikipedia page explains um, the Knapsack crypto system in a way that's really different from the paper. So if you have trouble reading the paper, then yeah, take a look at that. Um, so encrypting messages in the Knapsack, this is kind of boring, but uh, basically you break your message into binary. So the letter A, for example, is our message. Our knapsack is eight bits long, just like the letter A is eight bits long in ASCII. Um, and then you take, if, it's, if the first bit is zero, then you don't include the one in your sum. If it's one, you do, so you include the five. So I have an example here. You include five, and you include nine, because it's a one, zero, 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 so you don't include any of those numbers. And then one at the very end, so you include 1282. And you sum them, and then so the ciphertext is 1296. So basically, you create a sum based on a subset of the numbers from the set. And then, obviously, well, obviously, whatever. Um, if it's an easy knapsack, then uh, taking the ciphertext and getting the original sum back should be easy. If it's a hard knapsack, it's hard. So, uh, yeah, so does that make sense for everybody? If you're a math person, uh, the term for this is you turn the A, you turn your message into a binary end vector. So it's a set of numbers that are one zero one zero one zero whatever, and then you take the dot product of that with the uh, knapsack set, and so the zero is multiplied with one, which is zero, so it's not included in the sum. The one is multiplied with five, so five ends up in the sum. So they explain it in the paper as just a binary end vector, where you take the dot product of whatever. And I was like, I have no idea what that means, but the Wikipedia page explains it really well. So again, if you go to read the paper and it doesn't really make sense, check the Wikipedia page because it's great. Um, so, so Alexa, knapsack use, is it assumed that the set is as private as a key, treated as a key, or is the set publicly known? Um, so in this case, we're going to say that the set is publicly known. Okay. Uh, in order for somebody to encrypt a message to you, uh, the this, this set has to be publicly known. So that brings us to our next question, which is, we know that encrypting to an easy knapsack will be easy for anybody to decrypt. If we encrypt to a hard knapsack, any, nobody can decrypt. So that's not terribly useful to us. So the question is, can we make a knapsack that is hard for others to decrypt, but easy for us? So the previous example there, uh, no matter whether it's a hard knapsack or an easy knapsack, it's always easy to encrypt a message into it. And then the question of whether you can get it out is whether it's hard or easy. But it's equally hard for everybody, or it's equally easy for everybody. So it's not terribly useful. So that's where we come into the idea of these trapdoor knapsacks, which is if we publish the hard knapsack to the world, um, strangers can encrypt messages into it, which is easy. And then is there some way that we can make that hard knapsack into an easy knapsack, or have an alternative knapsack that makes it easy to solve the hard knapsack, uh, so that we can decrypt the message? So that's, that's the idea introduced. Now this is a lot of math, and I don't really want to get into it, because I don't totally understand why it was supposed to be secure. It's been broken, I, I mentioned. Um, my understanding of number theory as it relates to cryptography and stuff like that is that um, we have algorithms for doing things, like multiplying numbers, factoring numbers, whatever. Um, and usually they're all really slow until somebody comes up with a faster algorithm. So for factoring, as I mentioned previously, we're able to multiply them together quickly. We're not able to factor them. Um, it's just because nobody's come up with a faster factoring algorithm. Um, well, there is, there is ones that work on quantum computers that are very fast. But we don't have quantum computers yet, so it's still safe. Um, so basically, what you do is you have your set, you have your easy knapsack, uh, must be super increasing as before, because that's what makes it easy. Um, you pick two numbers, R and Q. R must be invertible mod Q, which means that it, uh, if you multiply something against it, it wraps around in a way that can be undone without ever coming to the same value. Um, that's like all I know about that math. Um, and then you make your trapdoor knapsack by multiplying each of these with R and then modulo Q, which means that you multiply it with R and then it wraps around based on how big Q is. Uh, and then that gets you your uh, hard knapsack. So something that you'll observe here is that the easy knapsack is easy because it's super increasing. The values are um, bigger than the sum of all the previous values, sequentially. The hard knapsack is not. It's, it looks like a hard knapsack. And that's, the, that's basically the, the idea of the security of it is that the hard knapsack is hard, the easy knapsack is not. Um, and the relationship here where you do um, a number uh, multiplied by R modulo Q when R and Q are picked carefully 
He said, you can undo this. You can convert a sum back into a sum for the easy knapsack. I don't really know why that works. I don't know why that was supposed to be secure, but it's not secure, apparently. Um, it's kind of similar to RSA and, and uh, other algorithms that we use today, uh, like, like Diffie-Hellman, uh, which is used in SSL everywhere. Um, basically, you take a number uh, and you raise it to a power, and then it wraps around modulo. Just like, just like in here, where you do a number multiplied, as opposed to to the power of something, but it's the same thing really. And then modulo a certain number. Usually it's a prime, it's a prime number in Diffie-Hellman. It's a composite of two primes in RSA. Just so happens to be secure. I'm not really sure why. Again, it's the question of we have, we're able to multiply numbers fast. We're not able to divide them or take the discrete log of something, which is undoing, um, undoing something to the power of something else quickly. Um, we, we're, we're not able to do those fast, so it, it's secure for now. Um, that's what Merkle thought when he made this. He thought there would be no way to undo this easily, uh, and it turns out to be wrong. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. So this uh, this is copied verbatim from the from the paper. Um, question: uh, What's modulo? Oh, good question. So, um, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, modulo is if you think of like a clock. Um, you know how. You have numbers that, you know, that the hour hand on the clock goes 1, 2, you know, 3, 4, all the way up to 12, and then it wraps around to 1 again. That's modulo. That's the whole idea. So uh, the hour hands on a clock, um, that would be considered modulo 13, because there's 12 possibilities. So basically, whenever you get above the value 12, so if you multiply two numbers together, um, or if you, let's say, we'll, we'll take the clock example. So you have uh, 8 p.m. Okay, I'm going to get this arithmetic wrong because I suck at like all arithmetic. But let's say 10 p.m. 10, I guess a.m. and p.m. doesn't matter on a 12-hour clock. You take 10 o'clock and you add 4 to it, so that would get you um, 14, right? But because there's only 12 hours on a clock, once it gets to 12, it wraps back to 2. That's what modulo is. So you multiply two numbers, and then if it goes over the modulo, then you just subtract that until you're back within the range of of that. So. Uh, somehow adding the modulo makes it more difficult to undo. Not really sure why. Um, it's the same thing with the other algorithm, algorithms we use today. If you take a number and raise it to a certain power, modulo something, uh, that we can do fast. But then going the other way, which is called the discrete log problem, nobody knows how to do fast. And so our communications are secure today. But if somebody comes up with a way to do that fast, which is you know basically doing clock math backwards, uh, then we're screwed. But nobody has in the past like 20 years. So. Uh, thank goodness for that. So, moving right along. Um, so, uh, the idea of hash based signatures. So, this is, we've covered like two different primitives already now. So, oh, and it's 750, so that's um, So, Signatures that we use today are based on the same kind of problems that I was talking about before, where you have like factoring and discrete log and these, you know, basically people just don't know how to do things fast. Um, that's the only reason that they're secure. So hash-based signatures, if you remember hashes from previous, from before, where you have some arbitrary input and you can make a thumbprint that nobody can find an alternative input to, for that thumbprint. Um, assuming that those are secure, then uh, Merkle proposes a way to build signatures out of that. It's not as efficient as schemes are today, but it is still secure, and it's uh, provided that the hashes are big enough, that the outputs are big enough, um, say 256 bits or, 100 or, 200 or 512 bits, uh, then it's secure against uh, quantum attacks. There's no, no fast way to break them, so that's, uh, that's really exciting. And that's, again, uh, from 1979, so that's kind of neat. Um, so the, uh, um, the idea of hash based signatures starts with the simple idea of being able to Authenticate a single command. A sim, a sim, uh, if, we, if, if you're a stockbroker and uh, I want to sell my stocks once they hit a certain value that makes me a lot of money, I tell you that. But then when I actually want to give that order, when I want to actually tell you to do it, uh, you should be able to prove that it's actually me, that I'm not somebody random who happens to have the same voice that calls. So the way that that is done is you make a random string and you hash it, and you give the broker the hash. So remember by the properties of hashes that you can't find an input for it if the random string is long. And um, you can't, uh, yeah, can't find the input. That's the important part of, uh, the important property for that, this kind of problem. And then so when you actually go to give the sell order, 
you say, I'm ready to sell now, and here's my secret, and here's the secret string. And then the, uh, the broker can take it and hash it and see that they match and know that it was actually you that gave it. So that basically just allows you to authenticate a one bit. It doesn't allow you to authenticate a zero bit because you, you, can, uh, you can't verify that you didn't or did send it. It can be, you know, somebody can not allow it to go through and then it doesn't, doesn't end up going through. Um, you know, there's the idea of pretending you didn't get it, whatever. So it only really works for one bits, which is uh, kind of takes a bit to wrap your head around, but uh, if you ignore that, you don't really need to know it, but it's interesting anyway. So extending it to multiple bits, um, the way that they do this, and they build it up again from smaller concepts, is that if you want to sign a 100-bit message, which we can use a, a hash to take from a big message to a small message to a 100-bit message, uh, you generate random strings, two of them for each bit. Um, and so you basically, yeah, you have two strings for each bit, and you keep those secret. Um, so you'll have 200 strings. Remember, two for each bit. There's 100 bits. So you hash each of those strings separately and you publish them. That's your public key. And so when people have that public key, when you sign a message, they can use that to verify your signature. Now this is a one-time scheme, which means you can only sign one message and then you have to start over with your public key, which is bad, but Merkle improves upon it. Um, so kind of the general algorithm is you have, the, you have these 200 strings. Each two of them corresponds to a zero or a one bit in the message. So when you have a 100-bit message, if it's all zeros, then you pick you, you reveal, just like you reveal here, you reveal you know, that single bit, you reveal the secret string for the zero. If it's a one, you reveal the one that corresponds to one bit. Um, I wish I had a diagram for this because it's kind of hard to explain verbally, but if that doesn't make sense to you, um, does it make sense to anybody? Clear? Okay. We can talk about it later too if you guys want. Um, yeah, so if you change any one bit, then it, it fails. Um, the signature will fail and you'll be able to detect that. So. That's cool, that bases entirely on hashes. As long as hashes are secure, the signature scheme is secure. The problem is you only have uh, one key. You can only have, uh, you can only sign one message and then you have to start over. Um, if you sign multiple messages, the security like halves every single time. So it's really one time. So Oracle's improvement on that is the use of hash trees, which is, um, BitTorrent actually uses this and so does the Git version control system. Basically the idea is you have this root hash. Um, and the only way to construct that root hash is each of these here is one of those like key pairs, a one-time signature key pair. So you keep them all secret. You don't have to publish the public keys because they're authenticated by this root. So you have all these, these, uh, these key pairs. They can all sign one message each. So you can change how long this is and in, you know, in turn increases how high the tree is. And so you hash the messages, so these are these are the public key, public key, public key, public key of each of these private keys, if that makes sense. And then you hash them together to get this, this uh, inner node. And you hash these two together to get this inner node, and these two together to get the inner node, and these two together to get the inner node, and you hash them, and then you hash them to get the, the top level root. And then, so you give that to everybody who wants to verify your signatures. Now, as an attacker, if all I have is that root, I can't sign any messages because that means I would have to find any kind of you know, input that would ma give me an output that matches that, which is infeasible, should be infeasible. Uh, brute force search of it is as far as breaking anything else, yes. provided the hash is secure, which they all are today because hashes are a solved problem, basically. Um, and then, so whenever you want to sign a message, you sign it in the conventional way, so you have your private key, you um, reveal you know, the ones and zero bits as much as you need to until you have the proper signature. And then you publish along with it, you publish this value and this value and this value. So basically you publish the ones that are missing from the tree and uh, then the person who's verifying it can generate the ones that are not and hash them all together and get that value. So basically in the end you're able, with all these private keys that you have that can only be used once, each time you sign you're able to make you're able to give them some data that will hash to that every single time. So when all your, you know, even though these are like 10 different keys, they end up hashing to the same thing every single time. So that's something that no attacker can do. And you can only do this by generating all this in advance and building this tree in advance. So that is kind of bad because it means you have to generate a whole bunch of stuff. You have to do a whole lot of hashes in advance. But it's good because you only have this tiny little root node. Uh, which is a single hash, so that's easy to distribute to people. 
Signatures are a little bit bigger than just a regular one-time signature, so you have to publish all you have to publish all the intermediate nodes every single time. Uh, but it's not too bad because it's a binary tree, so it's some like it's like log two of the height of the tree or something like that. Um, further improvements that have been made on this uh, is generating these from a seed value. So you just you know uh, encrypt or you use this as a key. You use your seed value as a key and you generate all these from the key, and then you create the thing and then you delete all this intermediate work, and you just have this the secret. The, the, the secret seed and you uh, uh, generate all this stuff on the fly when you need it. So that is a storage time trade-off. You take a little more time to make signatures, but you don't have to store as much. Um, and then there's another scheme based on this, which is called Sphinx by Daniel Bernstein, which is uh, he's this very opinionated cryptographer who's very brilliant and gets into fights with people a lot, but uh, he is, again, brilliant. Um, and it somehow uses hypertrees, and that makes it so that Oh, okay, so that brings me to something that I think that is important to know. So this is secure today, secure against quantum attacks, provided the hash is big enough. Um, the problem with it, though, is that if you reuse any one of these keys, the security halves, which is really, really bad. Um, so you might just think, why don't you just you know, have a little file which says which ones you've used and not used? Uh, so for anybody who's used a virtual machine, have you ever cloned a virtual machine before? So if your file says, I've used these two, but none of those, and then you clone that virtual machine. Now you have two machines which have the same uh, set of unused keys. So they both go to sign a message, they both use the same key for different messages, security breaks. So it's uh, um, the idea of eliminate the state, which is not an anarchy thing, it's really just that algorithms like this should not be stateful because if you end up, uh, if the state duplicates or whatever, then you reuse this uh, key and then, uh, then the security breaks. So that, I am just about out of time. Um, <coughs> I think that's about it. Yeah, oh, so uh, this is my favorite part of the paper. Um, this ginormous paper where these guys were inventing public key cryptography. Uh, basically, they were talking about how they encouraged each other and basically broed hard and ended up uh, you know, delivering the paper and it was all good. And you know, our lives have not really been the same since because these guys made a lot of things possible. So that's pretty cool. If you guys are ever working with other people and you know that uh, they're struggling or whatever, reach out to them and uh, give them the encouragement because you might just you might just help them change the world. Um, that's all I have. Anybody have any questions or anything? Round of applause.